This is a mandatory soft story program, keyword being mandatory. We have three great DBI experts here for you. Matt Rawls, Chu Lu, and Susie Song. Induce yourselves, please, and get us started. Thank you, Gary. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this year's Earthquake Safety Fair. Thank you for attending. We're here to answer any questions you may have concerning the mandatory soft story program. My name is Matt Rawls. This is Chu Lu and Susie Song. Chu and I are uh, civil engineers. Uh, Chu's also a geotechnical engineer. We've been performing uh, most, many of the plan reviews for the soft story program. Susie Song is a permit technician at our information soft story window uh, eight. So be before we begin the question and answer session, I'd like to present a quick overview of the program, uh, what a retrofit consists of, which building owners are under serious pressure to get started immediately, and how to comply with the program. This presentation material and much more is available at our website, Soft Story website, and then we have the information desk at window eight at 1616 Mission. And the Structural Engineers Association of Northern California, known as SEONC, uh, has a good website with a, a tremendous amount of information. So when you visit our site, you'll see these links up here. There's one for property owners, for tenants, for design professionals, for contractors, frequently asked questions, and so forth. Background information on the program, uh, U.S. Geological survey predicts a 63% chance of another large earthquake that will strike San Francisco in the next 30 years. The intensity will be at least predicted at least to be as large as the Loma Prieta or Northridge earthquakes. Back in 2009, a community action plan for seismic safety, uh, San Francisco panel charged with improving earthquake safety, found that buildings with no retrofitting are projected to have a one in four chance of collapse rate during a serious quake, while those with minimum retrofitting have a one in 30 chance of falling down. So given the stakes, the Board of Supervisors enacted the soft story ordinance over four years ago to help to ensure the safety of our residential occupants and the resilience of San Francisco housing stock this legislation requires a retrofit of all older, larger, multifamily wood frame residential buildings that contain a soft story condition. These buildings house over 115,000 San Francisco residents and are susceptible, susceptible to strong damage in an earthquake because of a weakness found in the building's lower story. The ordinance's purpose is to mitigate these soft story risks to damage and collapse due to strong earthquake and ground shaking and to thereby diminish the amount of uninhabitable housing following an earthquake disaster. What is a soft story building? Again, wood frame uh, built prior to 1978, two or more stories over a basement or underfloor area that extends above grade, contains five or more units, and has a weak or soft story condition where the first story is substantially weaker and more flexible than the stories above due to lack of walls or frames on the first floor. Typically, these buildings contain large open areas for parking or commercial spaces such as restaurants and convenience stores on the ground floor and offer, often feature large windows and uh, garage door banks, leaving the building highly vulnerable to damage in an earthquake. Again, why are, they, why are soft story buildings so dangerous? Past earthquakes have demonstrated that soft story buildings are particularly vulnerable to severe damage or collapse in a major earthquake relative to other building types. The collapse itself poses a risk, safety risk to the occupants, and additionally, the collapse could ignite fires that threaten the safety of occupants in neighboring buildings. The city estimates that 43% to 85% of these soft story buildings would be uninhabitable following a major earthquake, and such widespread damage could displace 58,000 residents, 2,000 businesses, and 7,000 employees 
associated with those buildings. Devastation of this magnitude could impede the city's disaster recovery and future economic welfare. Now, these next pictures illustrate the characteristically dangerous behavior which a soft story buildings can exhibit in a earth, strong earthquake. These are post Loma Prieta, the three upper floors unaffected, the ground story laterally distorted and vulnerable to imminent collapse. This next picture is one that did collapse. No ground story is visible. Second and third stories collapsed onto the ground story. Okay, so what is a retrofit? How can the soft story be mitigated? These their lines of lateral resistance must be added not only at the open front, but also in the open interior areas. Primarily, wood shear walls uh, with anchor bolts and hold downs are used. Uh, the hold downs over here are a very important feature of the shear walls because they prevent the overturning of the shear panels. And the shear walls are used at the underfloor space, uh, where we, we call those cripple walls, and, uh, and they're used at the existing walls where they're available. <clears throat> uh, new, these new walls typically require new footings, uh, but new, new walls are hard to construct in the open parking spaces and commercial spaces, so this next slide shows moment frames and they span the garage openings and storefront windows. Some proprietary frames that were presented today uh, at the booths reduce the need for intensive welding at the connections. Another option in the next slide, similarly, is a cantilever column. And those uh, where you have lower headroom, you can eliminate the beam above. The next slide shows uh, collectors and diaphragm strengthening, and collectors gather the lateral earthquake loads from the large areas of the building, like the floor diaphragm, and deliver them to structural elements, such as shear walls, that can resist that force. Collectors usually extend the full width of the building, and typically all work can be done from the target story and not go above into the second uh, floor where it's occupied. So properties in the program have been divided into four tiers. Uh, the higher occupant load and low ambulatory uh, occupancies were first, educational assembly, residential care. Tier two is 15 or more dwelling units, which is the next highest occupant count. Tier three is all the others, less than 15 units. And tier four was a uh, business and mercantile commercial uses and liquefaction zones. They're allowing more time for tenant coordination and uh, soil conditioning if the owner chooses. So the status is shown on this next slide. So one, tiers one and two over the last few years, uh, they're nearly 100% complete. Tier three is what we're talking about today. Uh, about 1,600 of you owners still have yet to submit. And then tier four is about 40% in advance of compliance. So the tier three owners who have not submitted are in serious jeopardy of not meeting the deadline, which is three months away. The engineers are busy. It might take two months to prepare permit drawings for submittal. But once you have that permit submittal into us, you do have two years to complete the retrofit. So step one to compliance, work with the licensed design professional who has a resume of experience in seismic strengthening. Many of them were here today at the booths and develop a retrofitting plan. Call several engineers, obtain, uh, perform a job walk, obtain the proposals, check references, and select your design professional. We also recommend you uh, request the original building plans if they're available from our records department it might save your engineer several hours of creating as-builts for your floors. We require a floor plan of the target story and the uh, f typical floors above so we can verify the wall layout. <clears throat> How do I find an engineer? 
if you go to our website, the Soft Story website, we've had a list of engineers who have attended these workshops and seminars over the years. You can visit the AIA website, Department of Consumer Affairs, other websites, phone book, and uh, other building owners. The next slide shows the Seonk website, and there you can type in a soft story for your project type, and a reference list will come up of engineers for you to choose from. The engineering proposals uh, you receive, there's some important items to cover. Uh, the scope of work, cost, and schedule, primarily, but the scope should also think about including the site visit and evaluation of your building, exploratory demo, if required, uh, that would require an over-the-counter permit, which you can get in a uh, short amount of time, one day. Uh, the construction drawings, uh, over-the-counter permit review, if you want that option, uh, response to the plan review comments, and the structural observations, the engineer visits the site at the end of the job and makes sure, uh, or during the job, frequent visits to make sure it's going in as he designed. There's also plan revisions due to field conditions that maybe were concealed at the time the drawings were put together, uh, utilities in the way of shear walls or some other concealed conditions. The engineer has to review the special inspection testing reports and issue a final letter. There's a website by the California Department of Consumer Affairs, uh, which is a guide for consumers, and that would be helpful for you to read as well. The next slide just shows uh, how to navigate the, to get to records management division to request drawings. Okay, step two. Come down to the 1660 Demission Street to file the application. So you need a complete uh, application form. They submit the structural uh, upgrade plans with calculations, two wet sign steps, stamp sets, a signature required on the first sheet. All others may be electronically stamped. If you have a commercial space, you'll need to include a disability access checklist. We'll go through that a little more later. And uh, drop off the plans to intake plan review. It may, might take, uh, this say, approximately six weeks to review and uh, issue comments. But if there's a rush to get started for some reason, even though you have two years to complete, you can bring the design professional who drew up the plans with you down for over-the-counter permit filing. And typically, uh, if it's mainly plywood shear walls, he'd be able to respond to any, any comments at that time, and you should be able to walk away with the permit at that time. Uh, but there is a one-hour limit, so if there's some uh, special moment frames and some other uh, engineering that requires longer review, uh, we would probably have to turn you away and request uh, intake on that. But once you're approved and paid your permit fees, you can now f move forward with the con construction plans. So proceed with the work uh, accordingly. Discuss with your general contractor and coordinate the following issues, notifying tenants, the work hours, work areas, start and finish dates. Be sure and get all the inspections as required by code. The uh, owner is required to hire a third party special inspector. And the building code requires certain work to be inspected by a special inspector as a quality assurance measure. It must be retained by the owner a uh, special inspection form include with the plan set. The DBI website maintains a list of firms pre-qualified to provide special inspections. Typical special inspection items include concrete sampling and placement, reinforcing steel, welding, anchor pull testing, hold downs, shear wall nailing, and structural observation. Uh, step four is the closeout. Uh, you will be issued a final certificate of completion and occupancy, a CFC, once the job card is signed off uh, by the final inspect building inspector. A copy of the CFC document will then be need to be submitted to the soft story counter. There's an email address there. 
uh, that will complete your participation in the mandatory seismic retrofit program. But be sure and collect all your documents from your contractor, the permit application, job card, permit set of drawings, and the CFC. Now, if a property owner fails to comply with any of the requirements of this program, uh, this placard may be promptly posted on your building and enforcement and abatement action may be taken by DBI once a notice of violation is issued and the case will be referred to the code enforcement section for further administrative actions. But keep in mind this retrofit is protection of your asset. Uh, it, it may be less than uh, insurance premiums uh, over the years uh, uh, that may only cover a percentage or have a cap on the damage in an earthquake anyhow. So, uh, wanted to talk about the final group, which isn't due until next September, but this is tier four, the commercial spaces. This tier requires uh, two separate permits, one for the commercial space and one for the residential. And the project cost is allocated by floor area. In addition, 20% of the commercial cost uh, would be used for accessibility improvements at the ground floor. So for example, if, if the retrofit was $90,000 and you had a three-story building, the two floors of residential would be the $60,000 permit, and then the one floor of commercial would be the $30,000 permit, plus 20%, the $6,000 would be used towards disabled access. So uh, we recommend you get started now on these uh, to schedule the work hours and work areas impacting operations of your uh, commercial tenant. The next slide is the DA checklist, page one and form C, the 20% rule. Forms are to be included with your plans. Next slide, uh, wanted to bring your attention to a new ordinance. The uh, that requires the primary entries to buildings and the path of travel into the building to be accessible by persons with disabilities. So if possible, work on the entrance with your 20% if it does not meet code. And finally, how do I find contractors? Uh, again, our soft story website, we have the sign up sheets from these various uh, summits we've had. Uh, the Department of Consumer Affairs has a website. And uh, the next slide shows you uh, a table of the different websites uh, I've used to put this information together. I wanted to remind you also that uh, before you dig, many of these uh, lateral lines of resistance will need new footings. So call 811 before you dig. And uh, uh, back on that last slide, I uh, wanted to mention the financial. What was the financial at the bottom? The uh, counterpoint is offering some public financing options. You could check into their booth over there. Okay, with that, I'd like to open it up for questions. And Chu will be calling on people. And uh, please stand up. Thank you, Matt. I want uh, Susie to have an opportunity to speak. Susie, tell us where you sit and what do you do in terms of helping to make this process efficient? Okay, our counter is on the first floor, number uh, when, uh, number eight. And then we helping the customer to go through the permit process. And also we track the permit status for the uh, property owners or the tenants. And then also if you have any question regarding the software program or you want to submit any um, Exemption request, you will need to come to counter number eight, and then I will help you to go through the process. Thank you. Okay, so, Matt, what happens if I'm a property owner and I just don't want to do this? <laughs> and I'm issued an NOV. What is, a, what is an NOV? What, what does that mean? Notice a violation. Go ahead, Chu. You know for, the, for, the no, for the notice violation, if you don't comply, it go to hear our, um, our internal meeting for the 
then after that, you got to commission me. You got to kick up each level if you don't comply. In that up, you put the lien on your building. So if you go to involve the city attorney, you don't want to get to that far. Keep kicking up. He just said the magic word. They put a lien on your property. That's the magic word. So the NOV is a serious issue because if you intend to sell your property at some point and there's a lien, we all know what that means. So uh, I invite you guys to come up and ask questions now. <laughs> yeah. It's getting difficult. Yeah. Don't be shy. <laughs> she does it. Okay. Yeah, others. You, can you go there? Well, this. You go to the speakers. And do we want to pass it around? Or, or if you got question, please. Up. There we go. If you got question, please go to the speaker so everybody could hear you. Yeah, you just mentioned about the notice of violation, right? Yeah. yeah. And uh, I, I was wondering the new ordinance 5116 accessible business entrance program. Are you going to issue the notice of violation if we don't uh, submit the checklist by the 22nd of May, uh, 2018? Yeah. Is it that you are going to issue the notice of violation too? Yeah. Let me repeat the question the lady asking for. She's asking for the entrance for the ADA program. That's a, that new program is starting it. She asking for do we going to issue the violation if you don't comply for that ordinance or not? The short answer to that question is yes. All the ordinance is like a law. So if you don't comply with it, we're going to issue the notice of violation for it. So uh, we have to complete it uh, before February 20, 22nd, 2021. Uh, that's correct. Uh, so this is only for San Francisco properties? Yes. Thank you. Good question. Thank you. I'm going to do my best to repeat that gentleman's question. Okay. So he has a six unit building. Uh, it does not have a garage and it does not have a lower unit. Uh, it does have two retail spaces that were added afterwards, uh, retrofit effectively or a renovation. And, and he has received a notice of violation so he wants to understand what his next steps are. The next step he, sh he should do is come to, the eighth, come to our um, first floor, I'm building number, I'm a window number 10 to starting to clear that violation. And at the same time, he needs the higher engineering to evaluate the building and pro provide drawing to us for the, for the, for the seismic retrofit. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how does this um, seismic retrofit uh, affect the uh, property value? I mean, the property tax. Um, the city assessor just in here like a couple, like big a few hours ago. You would not reassess your property value. For, for this yeah. program? For this program. Okay. But for all the seismic retrofit, you would not be reassessed. I, the believe, I believe there's a form you, you need to fill out. You yeah. can get it at their website. Yeah. And if we don't find our property on this uh, government's list, that means uh, we don't have to do it. The list is incomplete. So if you are if you are fall in that criteria, that you should do it. Uh, my question is, during the retrofit and after the completion, can we raise the rent? Is there any restriction? Can I raise one hundred percent or what? I think that question, the rent board would answer your question better. I believe it, for the seismic retrofit portion, you could pass through your cost to the tenant, but I don't know what is the mechanism, how you can do it, how, how far you can do it. That's that question, please ask rent board. They would have a better answer for me. I would not have that answer for you. Uh, this is, hi, I'm Jennifer Rakowski yeah, with Jennifer. the San Francisco yeah. Rent Board. So once you have completed your seismic uh, retrofit, you are able to submit a seismic capital improvement pass-through to the rent board. What 
we need is your proof of cost and your proof of payment for the completed work. And then over a 20-year amortization period to all of the tenants who benefit from the earthquake safety upgrades, you would have your regular base rent and then there would be a capital improvement pass-through imposed as well. The entire amount? So it's a, you're eligible for a 100% pass-through if it's a mandatory seismic retrofit, yes. I see. Amortize over? Over 20 years. If they move out, you can raise your rent. So, and the petition forms are at our table. That's the first one as you leave this uh, workshop area. Thank you, everybody. Thank you guys very much. You said the list was incomplete. What happens if the property's on, it's not on the list, but it is a soft story property. What happens to the owner? Let's call it two years from now or right now. And it's found to be, it, it is on, it should have been on the list, but it was missed. What happens in that scenario? Are they gonna be hit with a, are we gonna be hit with a, a fine? I mean, what happens? That I would not know. It could be hit with fire. That could be hit with fire that I don't know. I mean, so there's no mechanism? I mean, we're just supposed to know? You are required by that ordinance. You have to complete it by, if your tier one is by last year. Is it tier two? What if it's not on the list is what I'm saying? If it's not on the list, just like you're not on the list doesn't mean you're not in the program. They, they, they already passed the law. The law, already, just like when they pass the law, you have to understand. Yeah. All, the, all the kids have to un, un, uh, upgrading uh, babysit. You don't know about it. But you're driving through it. You use the old car seat, so you violate the law. So that's how okay. it is. You, even though you so the don't onus is on the owners. Yes, yes. it's always right. on the owners. The owners so. is on the owners. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes, I. Uh, I think maybe my question is, is part of what was just discussed, but mm -hmm. I just want to make sure I understand. Uh, first, I I th I was under the impression that two to four unit buildings were not part of the process right now. Is that, that correct? That's correct. correct. Under five four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Five or more. Okay, so five or, or more, because here it says tier three less than 15 units. Uh -huh. well. and, uh, and this is due by September or within a, within a couple, few months. And what, you're, what, what I understand is two to four units might be part of the program at a, at a future date, and I think it's a good idea that it should be, but it's, this is not what it says over here. That's a mistake. Here. It should have said more than five, but less than 15. So yeah. I apologize for that, Eric. Okay, yeah. good. Yeah. No. Yeah. Thanks for bringing Thank it you. up. Um, during this uh, retrofit period, um, any inconvenience caused to the tenant? Can the tenant file a complaint and request rent reduction? So there are a couple of things to consider. So if to do the work, there needs to be a temporary severing of certain housing services. So parking, storage, uh, laundry, for instance. You will need to proactively, before you begin the work, give a 30-day notice to sever the housing service. And under uh, Chapter 65A, it spells out a compensation plan either based on what was in the initial contract or what is the current allowed value of that particular service, or you have the option to provide a replacement service for the tenant. So in that notice, you need to specify when the work is beginning, when the work is ending, and compensate upfront that daily cost for that particular service. And once the work is complete, that service needs to be restored back to the tenant. If for some reason there is maybe the beams to improve the safety 
cut into someone's storage, so there's a permanent reduction in someone's storage space, then they would be eligible at that point in time to file a decreased housing service um, for something that was not temporary. Um, but so you need to review particularly Chapter 65A, and we have copies of that at our table. Thanks. So the work needs to be complete. You need to have submitted your initial petition into the rent board, and you need to submit it into the rent board within five years of completing the work. That's not my question. The question is, it, with, with, the, with the, uh, the retrofit, is there a time frame for the retro, like six months? If you, say if, if it took you two years to do the retrofit. With the rent board, is there a time frame where you can't? So tenants who began their occupancy within six months of you contemplating the work are uneligible to have the capital improvement passed through. For the time frame for the work being done, in other words, if it took a year to do this work, that's irrelevant because you cannot, you cannot start the pass-through until the work is complete. So how long it takes you to do the work is not a relevant factor. Okay, one last question for the group so that folks who haven't done anything don't lose heart. Matt, what's the most important thing? They don't have to complete the work. What do they have to do? Get their permit. And what do they have to do to get their permit? Hire an engineer. So that's not, that's not as onerous as you think it is. So it's not completing the work, it's starting the process. So I want to thank Matt, Chu, Susie, and the rent board for being very eloquent with us today. Thank you. Thank you.